Hello, Prime members. You can listen to British Scandal one week early and ad-free on Amazon Music or via the Wondery Plus subscription on the Wondery app or Apple Podcasts. Hi, Matt. Hi, Alice. Uh, you don't you don't look or sound very happy. Are you okay? Yeah, I guess. I just... You know when you take on a job and it sounded great and it seemed like a really brilliant opportunity and then when you get into it, like you're in too deep, you're like trapped, you just realise the truth that it's just sort of like your own living hell. Uh, n- no, I've never felt like that. What's happening? No, just I guess like hypothetically it kind of pollutes your private life. It ruins your work. Like you can't stop thinking about it. You can't sleep because it's just so bad. But you thought it was going to be paradise and then it's actually just the pits. Hang on. It- are you saying what I think you're saying? What do you think I'm saying? Do you want out? <sighs> what was that? There was supposed to be smoke and I was going to disappear. No, you just made a noise. I can see you. This is awkward. 10th of January, 1963, Beirut. Nicholas Elliott hurries past a busy street cafe, glances over his shoulder to check no one's following, then slips under the archway of a tall sandstone building. He's just flown in from London, and it's important no one knows he's here. Elliot quietly enters an apartment, watches a small team of MI6 technicians tape hidden microphones under the sofa and coffee table. They run thin wires under a rug and out to the kitchen. It's mad to think that now you could surveil someone with an iPhone more discreetly and more effectively. Back then, how did people not see just like reams and reams of wires and microphones? <laughs> Going under their bowl, into their cereal, out along the spoon and up their shirt sleeves. Elliot puts his head around the kitchen door. A stenographer adjusts his headphones and glances up at him. Everything working. We're ready for him, sir. Elliot walks back into the living room, takes off his black trim spectacles and polishes them slowly. His hands shake as he puts them back on. In a few minutes, he'll open the door to his oldest and closest friend, Kim Philby, and finally make him confess to being a KGB spy. The truth is, he's desperate to know whether their friendship, one that Elliot has cherished for over 20 years, has all been a lie. Was Philby always pretending, using him for information? Elliot feels sick at the thought of being so gullible, so open, so trusting. He pushes down his anger, takes a deep breath. Despite his fury, he's determined to be as professional and courteous as ever. Interview his closest friend with a cold detachment he's used with dozens of spies over the years. All his MI6 training has led to this moment. He checks his watch. It's nearly time. He puts a pad of paper on the coffee table, then adjusts a wooden tray with its two china cups and a pot of steaming tea. But as the minutes pass, Elliot begins to second-guess himself. There's hushed, urgent conversation coming from the MI6 team in the other room. Elliot's composure gives way to a rising panic. Where is Philby? If he's caught wind of the whole operation, he'll be long gone. Elliot won't have his chance to hold him accountable Elliot rushes over to the door, adrenaline flooding through his body. It's time to find out once and for all if this brilliant man, his oldest friend, Kim Philby, really is an enemy of the British state. From Wondery, I'm Alice Levine. And I'm Matt Ford. And this is British Scandal. So, Matt, what would you say are good characteristics for a spy to have? Okay, calm under pressure, intelligence, guile, subtlety, pre-planning, and a love of whiskey. (laughs) I think that's a full bingo card for all the character traits that I would say are largely absent from this story. It's completely mad when you think about it. If we start with Philby, he's met with the very real prospect of being unmasked. And what does he do? He smokes his pipe and hopes for the best. Burgess, he parades around Morocco telling everyone he hates the West. And my personal favourite, he draws the wife of the CIA boss with loads of pubes. That's good for keeping a low profile, isn't it? These men are basically 
anti-spies. They just should not have done as well as they did. But that is because of the elitist society in which they lived and the assumption, because of their background, that they would just fall on their feet in any given situation. There is this inexplicable bubble around them. Despite all their failings, the establishment just protects them. But, dare I make a prediction, I do think their luck may have run out. It's not looking great where we left them. Burgess got pissed and ended up in Moscow. I thought my Friday nights were bad. No, no, they are. This is episode three, The Third Man. Support for this podcast comes from Wise, the account that lets you send, spend and receive money internationally. 50 currencies, 170 countries, one account designed to take on the world. So whether you're taking on Rio or Rome, Miami or Mumbai, you'll always get the mid-market exchange rate when you convert currencies with no markups and no hidden fees. Wise helps you save money no matter where you're going next. And Wise Business has everything you need to run and grow your global business. So you can send money, receive payments and manage your cash flow wherever it flows. No extra legwork, no hassle. Companies like Xero and Google Pay are already managing their money the Wise way. Join 15 million people and businesses who are going global with Wise. Learn how the Wise account could work for you by downloading the app or visiting wise.com slash UK scandal. Tuesday the 29th of May, 1951, Washington. Kim Philby hurries down the corridor. He's on his way to see Jeffrey Patterson, the MI5 representative in Washington. He spent an anxious weekend waiting to hear if Donald McLean made it across the Iron Curtain. And now the embassy is buzzing with rumours that McLean's defected. Philby's just hoping it's true. As he walks in, Patterson gestures for him to sit. His face is shiny with sweat. It's official, I'm afraid. London have confirmed he's landed in Moscow. Philby allows a moment of relief before doing his best to look shocked. Donald McLean? A a, a traitor? How can a man live a double life like that? He watches Patterson fight back tears. I'm afraid to say he's not the only one. Guy Burgess went with him too. Philby stops, his mouth falling open in horror. A familiar fear takes hold. He he can't. Are you sure? Oh, man. I mean, that is the worst-case scenario. Philby slumps into his chair. He made it clear to Burgess that he had to return to Washington. Otherwise, they would suspect Philby immediately. Patterson shifts uncomfortably in his seat. I'm so sorry, Kim. I know how close you were. Well, you say that. I, you know what? I never liked him. Close. I mean, we were sometimes geographically close. Were we emotionally close? Were we brothers? No. Were we friends? Barely, barely. Philby looks up. Patterson's face is unreadable. A sense of paranoia creeps in. The intelligence services know that someone helped Burgess and McLean, an inside man. They'll be out for blood, and he's suspect number one. As soon as the meeting's over, Philby runs to his car, speeds home and gathers up his spy equipment. He shoves it all in the boot. He needs to get rid of it fast. He drives out to a wooded area, digs furiously. When the hole's big enough, he dumps all the equipment in, then covers it with a mound of fresh earth. Back at the embassy, he scrubs the dirt from his fingernails, splashes his face, heads back into the office. He sees a telegram on his desk. It's from Dick White, head of counterintelligence at MI5. He's been recalled to London for questioning. He looks at his telephone. If he rings his handler now, he could disappear, tonight. He picks up the receiver. He stops himself. If he goes through with this, he'll never see Eileen and the children again. Besides, if they had any firm evidence against him, they'd have arrested him by now. They certainly wouldn't let him travel freely to London. And if there's one thing he's good at, it's thinking fast under pressure. Surely he can charm his way out of this mess. He's done it for the last 30 years, after all. He takes a deep breath and decides. He's going to front this out. Convince White he's innocent and fight to the bitter end to clear his name. A few days later, London... Dick White strides into his office at MI5's HQ. As head of British counterintelligence, 
He's been bombarded with calls from the CIA to find out who else was involved in Burgess and McLean's disappearance. Someone must have helped them escape. Someone with a level of clearance high enough to access this kind of intel. The idea of a third man is humiliating. Philby's name has come up repeatedly. He watches Philby now through a two-way mirror. He's smartly dressed with neat, brill-creamed hair. White notices how his hands tremble as he pushes tobacco into his pipe. He'll let Philby stew for a while. 20 minutes later, he walks into the room, gives Philby a casual smile, and asks how well he knew Donald McLean. I may have met him once or twice at university. I can't remember. White raises his dark eyebrows. And what about Guy Burgess? Tell me about your friendship with him. He watches Philby's jaw shift slightly. We weren't close. White lets the silence fill the room. OK, let's start at Cambridge, where you and he were both communists, where you personally organised several demonstrations that ended in clashes with the police. He watches a smile flicker across Philby's face. Come on, Dick. We've all been young and foolish, made mistakes. You must understand that, as an Oxford man. White falters, watching Philby grin. He can't let Philby gain the upper hand. I hardly think now's the time for jokes. Do you, Kim? No, but an Englishman, Irishman and a Scotsman walk into a bar. He spends the afternoon making Philby go over the same information again and again. But Philby is impenetrable. After four hours, White stops the tape, calls a halt to the interview, watches Philby carefully, but he's as impassive as ever. When he's gone, White nods over at the stenographer. Get me that transcript as soon as you can. His long years of experience and a strong gut instinct tell him Philby hasn't said an honest word all afternoon. But a hunch isn't enough. He needs solid proof, and it's clear Philby's going to put up a fight. But he's a patient man. He'll keep calling Philby back to go over it again and again. And if that doesn't work, he'll find a more creative way to flush him out. Four years later, October 1955. MI6 office, London. Nicholas Elliott slams down his newspaper, stares at the headline dubious third man activities of Mr Philby. They're quoting a story from an American paper which claims that Kim Philby helped Burgess and McLean escape to the Soviet Union. Hold on, is this how White has managed to flush Philby out? This is the aforementioned creative way. Rather than try and get this story into the British press, which poses all kinds of difficulties, as we know, as we've discussed, the establishment closes ranks... Here, he's got free reign if he plants the story in the American press and hopefully there's a trickle-down effect where it then becomes a topic of conversation in Britain too. That is so clever. So if you want the gossip on what's happening in Britain, read the papers in America. Well, we've discussed this before, haven't we, with the coverage of certain stories that there are super injunctions about here or royal stories where the royals have an arrangement with the UK media, but that doesn't stretch to foreign publications. So there are definitely stories that, even in a time of the internet, we're sort of incubated from. God bless America. What is there to dislike? Elliot's furious. The press are putting his friend through hell without a shred of evidence. That is so unlike the press. He's determined to find out who's behind this witch hunt. Elliot runs up a flight of steps, taps on the door, hears his boss, Sir John Sinclair, call him in. Elliot thrusts the paper at Sinclair. This leak isn't just against Philby, it's putting the whole section under the spotlight. Is Dick White behind this? Sinclair juts out his chin. With help from the CIA, I suspect. Leaking to the American press is a smart move. We can't do anything legally. Elliot lights a cigarette to calm his nerves. He's never been so outraged. MI6 only works because men like him and Philby can trust each other. Without that, the whole damn organisation will fall apart. Dick White's interviews have turned up nothing. Yet poor Philby's lost his job with MI6. Elliot can't understand it. A few minutes later, he's back in his office when his secretary rushes up. Urgent call, sir, from Mrs Philby. She sounds very upset. 
Elliot arrives at Philby's house 20 minutes later to find it surrounded by jostling reporters. Eileen cowers behind the door as she lets him in. Philby slumped in a corner in his shirt sleeves, an empty bottle of whiskey at his feet. I can't even get the children to school. I, I don't know what to do. He bundles Eileen and the children into his car, drives them to a safe house, then goes back for Philby, sobers him up and takes him to his mother's flat. I'm going to put an end to this, Kim. I promise. Three days later, he makes his way to the House of Commons. He's led down a thick carpeted corridor to Foreign Secretary Harold Macmillan's office. The Commons are holding a debate on the third man. And Elliot's persuaded MI6 to let him write Macmillan's speech. He shakes Macmillan's hand, watches him smooth down his moustache. Our own chap's spying on us. It's a bloody embarrassment. And now the Americans are keeping nuclear secrets from us. It's an unseemly mess. Agreed, sir. That's why I'm here. We all need to end this third man speculation. He hands Macmillan the speech, watches as his eyes dart over the page. You're absolutely sure Philby's innocent. If there's any doubt... Elliot shakes his head. None, sir. He's completely innocent. You have my word. This is the highest of high stakes. He's going to let the Foreign Secretary effectively mislead the House and the country just because of his gut. It seems ludicrous that somebody whose job, whose professional drive and skill set is to be sceptical of everything they hear and see, is being led purely by this idea of my word is my bond, just by loyalty. I was going to say... I mean, can you imagine this happening now? The Foreign Secretary getting up to the dispatch box and reading out a load of nonsense. Then I remembered what happened in the last few years and just thought, how little has changed. An hour later, he sits in the House of Commons public gallery as Macmillan gets to his feet. No evidence has been found to show Mr Philby was responsible for warning Burgess and Maclean. I have no reason to conclude that Mr Philby has at any time betrayed the interests of this country or to identify him with the so-called third man, if indeed there was one. I mean, if you're Philby, what an amazing way to have your name cleared by the Foreign Secretary on the floor of the House of Commons. How many times do you think you can do that? How many scrapes can you get in where you're like, Harold, me again. I swear, Philby should be trusted. Yes, for those of you outside Britain, basically every British citizen gets one go at this. (laughs) The Foreign Secretary will defend you, but only once. It's where in Monopoly the get-out-of-jail card came from. Elliot leans back and smiles with relief. With the government's backing, these vicious rumours have to be put to bed. Philby's finally in the clear. Elliot is on his way to the tube when he sees the headlines in the Evening Standard. Riddle of the Third Man raises questions for Macmillan. He snatches it up in horror, stares at the photo of Philby underneath. Persuading the House is one thing. Winning over the press is another. Philby won't ever be in the clear if the papers aren't behind him. Elliot can't break MI6 rules and talk to them himself. But Philby's been dropped by the agency. And that means he can. November 1955. Philby's mother's flat, London. Philby sips his whiskey, straightens his tie. In a few seconds, he'll open the door and invite in a dozen journalists from around the world. And he'll convince them he's not the third man. It's the last thing Philby wants to do. He knows the risks of lying prostrate in front of the press, but Elliot has convinced him it's the right thing to do. Today is his last chance to clear his name, once and for all. Gentlemen, do make yourselves at home. One of them puts the telly on. (laughs) <laughs> the other one takes off his shoes and socks and puts them on the footstool. Is he having a bath? <laughs> Have you just put a Pop-Tart in the toaster? Can you imagine a time without Pop-Tarts? I don't want to. 55. That's why it was so tough back then. Philby serves cigarettes, beer and sherry from a tray. He cracks a few jokes as they set up newsreel equipment. But as someone switches on a bright spotlight, he feels a trickle of sweat run down the side of his face. The questions start. Did you all share the same politics at university, Mr Philby? His mouth starts to dry as he blinks at the dazzling light. He stutters out an answer when the reporter cuts in. And is it true you married a communist activist in Austria? Philby shifts uncomfortably in his seat, 
He can feel the eyes of the reporters bearing into him, willing him to stumble. He needs to take control of the situation, otherwise he's done for. He takes a breath to compose himself. My first marriage was quickly over. We all do reckless things in our youth. He smiles as a ripple of laughter goes round the room. He starts to feel more comfortable. Another reporter lifts his hand in the air, cigarette smoke dancing around his fingers. Can you say when your communist associations ended, if they did? Philby leans back, smirking. I haven't knowingly spoken to a communist since 1934. <laughs> Again, the room fills with laughter. Would you still regard Burgess, who lived with you for a while in Washington, as a friend? There's a pause. He feels his jaw shift nervously. I consider his actions deplorable. On the subject of friendship, I'd prefer to say as little as possible because it's very complicated. He chooses from the sea of hands that shoot up. They ask him his views on Russia, on the Cold War. Finally, a reporter asks outright, Mr Philby, are you the third man? He shakes his head. No, I'm not. Case closed. After they leave, he pours himself a stiff drink, loosens his tie and flops into an armchair. Tomorrow, the whole world will go over every single word he said and look for signs of deception. All he can do is hope they don't find any. The next day, he's hovering anxiously at the door as Eileen returns with the morning papers. He snatches them out of her hands, begins poring over the front pages. Every paper quotes his denial, and that's exactly what he wanted. He picks up the phone. It's Elliot. Just come out of a meeting with the chief. Philby holds his breath. Congratulations, old man. He's agreed to reinstate you. You're back in the fold. What kind of podcasts are you in the mood for? Award-winning? What about edge-of-your-seat thrillers? Interested in a thought-provoking mystery? Or perhaps something that'll teach you more about the world around us? Either way, Wondery Plus has you covered with ad-free episodes of your favorite podcasts and number one hits. Join Wondery Plus in the Wondery app or on Apple Podcasts. Hey, I'm Mike Corey, the host of Wondery's Against the Odds. In our next season, three friends backcountry skiing in Alaska disturb a hibernating bear and she attacks. The skiers must wait for help to arrive before one of them succumbs to his injuries. Listen to Against the Odds on Amazon Music or wherever you get your podcasts. Five years later, August 1960, a beach resort, Beirut. Philby runs out of the sea and flops down next to his new wife, Eleanor. He married her after Eileen's death three years ago. He kisses her, then lies back and soaks up the sun. His five children are here from England for the summer, and today they're having a beach picnic with the Elliots. But he can't relax. He's got a meeting with his handler tomorrow, and he needs to give him something big. He sits up, watches Eleanor and Elizabeth Elliot disappear into their shared luxury beach hut to prepare lunch. He leans over now and hands Elliot a warm can of beer. Since he arrived in Beirut, he's been on low-level operations. Dick White, now the head of MI6, has seen to that. The trouble is, his handler's getting frustrated. Philby has always been able to give Moscow high-level intel. He doesn't have that rank or status anymore, but Elliot does. So he props himself up on his side and starts chatting about work. For God's sake, Kim, enjoy the sun. Let's talk about work tomorrow. Philby grins. Of course, but how many chaps do we have in the region? How many, say, in Beirut? In this story, no one has quite mastered the subtle inquisition, have they? Look, I'm not a double agent, but just how many people do we have there? If you were to put a very specific, very accurate number on that. Elliot frowns slightly. Philby realises he's overstepped. So he casually brushes sand off his checked swimming trunks. You're quite right not to tell me. I probably gave far too much away when I was in charge. He watches Elliot squirm. For most of his career, he's been Elliot's boss. 
But now that role is reversed, and he knows deep down Elliot feels uncomfortable about it. The Soviets have increased their numbers in the Middle East, so we're increasing ours. Lunch is ready. Philby glances over his shoulder as Eleanor and Elizabeth carry out trays of food. He doesn't mind the interruption. He'll slowly get Elliot drunk, drip-feed him questions, and find out exactly where the British spies are posted. Tomorrow, he'll give it all to his handler, and for the first time since he's been in Beirut, he'll finally prove his worth. A few months later, London. Elliot jumps out of a black cab, tips the driver, and heads into the Mayfair restaurant to meet Dick White. He'd got a call an hour ago to meet him here as a matter of urgency. He takes off his hat and makes his way to the large table in the corner of the room. White slides a photograph across the table. Major Anatoly Galitsin, a senior officer in the KGB's strategic planning department, arrived in Helsinki a few months ago. The Americans have picked him clean, but the CIA have allowed him a visit here so we could do the same. Elliot stares at a picture of a stout man in a KGB uniform. His round face is framed with thick, dark hair. And you'd like me to interrogate him? White is silent for a moment. When he speaks, his voice is gentle. He's named Philby as a KGB agent. Whoa. Elliot slumps back like he's been punched. What? Uh, what? He, he can't have. What? Where's the proof? White pushes over a thick manila folder. Kim Philby, recruited at university along with Burgess and McLean by KGB agent Arnold Deutsch, codename Otto. Philby's been passing secrets to the KGB for almost 30 years. I'm sorry, Nick, but there's no doubt anymore. Uh, hello, Harold Macmillan, please. Elliot thinks for a second he might faint. Philby's been his closest friend for the last 20 years. He's told him everything, every secret, not just work, personal stuff. Things he's never confided in anyone ever before. Philby's been like a father figure to him. He's on his feet, though his legs feel like they might give way any moment. Uh, Excuse me. He rushes to the gents and throws up. A few minutes later, he makes his way back to the table sits in shocked silence as a waiter serves him a large steak with mashed potato. He pushes the plate to one side and slowly turns the pages of the file. He tries not to cry as the reality of Philby's duplicity sinks in. I'm flying to Beirut next week. I want a written confession from Philby. Full names, dates, everything. If he gives me that, I'll offer him a deal. Elliot lurches forward. No, I'll do it. If anyone can get a full confession, it's me. For a second, he's shocked at his own reaction. Part of him is horrified at the thought of seeing Philby. But he needs to do this. He watches White mop his mouth with his napkin, then slowly nod. Outside, he hugs the file to his chest. His eyes blur with tears. He feels betrayed and utterly humiliated. How could he have been so completely fooled all these years? He needs to get to the bottom of it. He's going to make Philby look him in the eye, finally tell him the truth, and he'll make him pay for his crimes. A few weeks later, January 1963, Embassy Flat, Beirut. Elliot sits in the living room and waits. He's determined not to show any emotion, but fear and anger are already rising in his throat. His heart thuds as he opens the door. Philby grins at him, open-armed. Nick, what a surprise. I thought you were in London. Elliot silently gestures Philby into the room. Is everything okay? Elliot wordlessly hands him a cup of tea, then looks into Philby's puzzled eyes. Your past has caught up with you. We know you're a spy, Kim. He watches Philby calmly put down his cup. Not this nonsense again. Has Dick White put you up to this? The man is obsessed. Elliot reaches into his bag, slams down the file, watches Philby's eyes widen as he sees the name Galitzin. It's all there. 
Proof you've been working for the KGB since the early 30s. We know you helped Burgess and McLean escape. We know everything about you, Kim. He looks at Philby, but his face is unreadable. It suddenly hits him that he never knew this man at all. He starts to tremble. He doesn't want Philby to notice, so he takes his Mont Blanc pen from his pocket and rolls it in his palms. I'm prepared to offer you full immunity, but I want the name of every KGB agent working in Britain and every secret you handed to Moscow. Come on, Nick. You don't really believe I'm guilty of this, do you? Elliot slams the pen on the table. Stop it. Just tell the bloody truth. You betrayed your country, your class, our friendship. You betrayed me. Every night out, every party, every weekend at cricket, you were using me. And for what? To prop up Stalin and his murdering thugs. He watches Fulby's face darken. I am a patriot, through and through. Just not to your bloody flag. I fought for a better society, and I'm proud of it. Elliot can't believe what he's hearing. How can someone so clever not see reality? Don't be so bloody naive, Kim. Your own handlers died in Stalin's death camps. It's not a worker's paradise. It's a dictatorship, and you've helped build it. Elliot falls silent for a few moments, then says quietly, My God, how I despise you. He slowly puts his pen in his pocket, scans Philby's face for any sign of guilt or shame, but he's defiant. It lights a fire inside Elliot. Here's the deal. Tell us everything, we'll give you full immunity. Or we'll make your life intolerable. We'll take your passport. You won't even be able to open a bank account. Your children won't be able to stay at their expensive schools. Don't be a bloody fool, Kim. Give us what we want, for both our sakes. He watches Philby smile sadly. Doesn't look like I have much choice, does it? Elliot feels a lump in his throat. He looks away. I'll pick you up tomorrow. Four o'clock sharp. Philby stands, walks to the door, but stops in the doorway. He turns and looks at Elliot. Despite what you think of me, I valued our friendship. Very much. Elliot slumps back, listens to the faint whir of the tapes in the next room. He's got what he came for. In a few hours, the transcripts will be on their way to London. But now all he can do is lower his head and silently weep. Kim Philby, his oldest friend, his closest confidant, is a liar and one of the biggest traitors the British state has ever seen. The following morning, Beirut. Philby stands on the balcony of his fifth-storey flat and gazes out at the heavy rain. He hasn't slept all night. He's facing the biggest decision of his life and he's completely torn. He looks down at the yellow book in his hands. If he holds it in front of his chest now, it's a signal to his handler down below that he wants to flee. He looks across at his sleeping wife. The thought of leaving her is killing him. He closes his eyes, feels the rain on his skin. Elliot's disgusted face flashes in front of him. He looks down at the yellow book, holds it tight to his chest, watches his handler nod, then hurry off in the rain. Half an hour later, he grabs his small rucksack and makes his way to the street below. He rushes down an alley and meets his handler. Your papers aren't ready. We need more time. Philby glances behind him, desperation palpable in his voice. I haven't got any bloody time. If I'm not with Elliot at four, they'll know something's up. You need to get me out. Two hours later... Philby watches his handler give the captain of a cargo ship a wad of notes. He can't understand what's being said, or even exactly where the ship is going. Before he gets a chance to ask his handler, he's disappeared. The captain beckons for him to follow him into the bowels of the ship. Philby follows the captain to a tiny cabin with a small bunk and a steel sink. 
The smell of sweat and diesel makes his stomach turn. He sits on the dirty bunk, alone. His old life is over. His life of parties, of dinners with prime ministers and presidents, of his London club. He blinks back tears. He thinks about his family asleep and warm in their beds. He knows now he will never see them again. He looks at the wall of the ship bearing down on him and thinks about his likely destination, the Soviet Union in the dead of winter. He thinks about communism, the ideal he sacrificed his life for, that all men should be equal, that a better world is possible. He lies down on his bunk, looks up at the damp ceiling above him and wonders if in the end, all the years of sacrifice, of betrayal, of lying to the people he loves, were ever actually worth it. A few hours later, Beirut. Elliot sits in the back of a taxi outside Philby's apartment block, squinting up into the sun. He's here to pick up his old friend, take him to the embassy and get him to sign his confession. But Philby hasn't come down, and now he's 15 minutes late. Unforgivable. If you're going to sign your own confession, at least be punctual. Can you imagine if this was me? They're like, she's done a runner. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm not. I'm just 23 minutes late. Sorry. I I can see why that would cause alarm, but I just couldn't decide what to wear. Traffic bad, was it? Don't start. Elliot stares at the door, dabbing his sweaty forehead with a handkerchief. He feels his stomach lurch. Philby is never late. A terrible thought hits him, that Philby's fled. But that wouldn't make any sense. He wouldn't abandon his wife and children, surely. Mm. Elliot hands the driver a crumpled Lira note, tells him to wait, then rushes out. He runs up to Philby's flat, bangs on the door. When Eleanor answers, he pushes his way in. Where is he? Eleanor looks shocked. He's with you. He left me a note, said you'd both gone on a trip. What's going on? Elliot crumples to the ground. For a moment, he can't speak. Philby's humiliated him again. He had the most important Soviet spy in history in his grasp. And he let him go. All he can think of now is what he's going to tell Dick White. It's incredible that this guy who realises he's been deceived for years and wants to get the confession out of him, still treats him with a sort of friendship and respect that the revelation that the guy's lying to him really should have dispelled. And logic tells you, when a liar and a con man has his back against the wall, that's probably not the moment he's going to decide to turn over a new leaf. I think old habits are probably going to die hard. Okay, I have been lying about everything for the past 30 years, but I'm telling the truth now. A day later... Elliot's back in London, walking over Westminster Bridge to meet White. His mouth dries as he watches White storm towards him. Why the hell weren't you watching the ports? Elliot looks out at the river. I really thought he'd take the deal. He he gave me his word. White throws his hands up and lets out an ironic laugh. Elliot feels his face redden. The CIA already know about Philby's departure. Elliot stops. How? Who told them? White shrugs. The Americans think we're incompetent, or worse, corrupt. They're refusing to share any more nuclear secrets. It's a bloody mess. The implications of this are huge. It's not just about people at the top of the British establishment being double agents and all the security concerns that go with that. Our strongest ally during the Cold War, when nuclear weapons are crucial to our defence, is refusing to cooperate with us. Absolutely, and that wasn't just a moment in time. The special relationship, that bond between America and the UK took decades to mend. They fall silent for a moment, then White sighs. To be honest, he might have done us a favour. At least this way there won't be any drawn-out court cases scrutinising our work. God knows we could do without that. White pauses and holds Elliot's gaze. We think it's best if you take some leave, Nick. Elliot watches White hurry away. Something in his voice sounded final. 
He looks out now at the Houses of Parliament. He's dedicated his life to his job, to the country. And now it's all come crashing down around him. It's not just his pride that's been wounded by Philby's deception. Thanks to his best friend, his once promising career is over. His whole reputation is shattered and his trust in those around him has been broken forever. September 1963, a small apartment, Moscow. Philby spreads out his copy of The Times, starts to carefully iron it. He reads about a train robbery in Buckinghamshire. Oh, Philby, you'd have loved our podcast about it. I love these moments when the MCU has its kind of crossovers. The BSU? The BSU? Does it work? Yeah. It's a month out of date, but he doesn't mind. Inside are several pages on his own defection. Reports of heated debates in Parliament about who's to blame, and the public rage at his betrayal. He folds the paper neatly, puts it under his arm. His KGB minder opens the door to let him out. He'd been told by his handler before he left that he'd be a colonel in the KGB. It wasn't true. Instead, he's guarded day and night by armed officers. Today, though, he's been allowed to see Guy Burgess. He'll give him the paper as a gift, a goodwill token to let him know his defection all those years ago is forgiven. He's surprised at how much he's looking forward to seeing him. Life in Moscow has been much lonelier than he could ever have imagined. He sits in the car and looks at the crossword, resists the urge to fill it in. When he looks up, the car's stopped outside an anonymous-looking building. His heart sinks. He's been here before, dozens of times. His minder isn't taking him to see Burgess. He's brought him back to this KGB building for questioning. He wearily makes his way up the concrete steps, sits down opposite four uniformed interrogators. They ask him the same questions as last time. How was it so easy to smuggle out secrets? How did he rise up the ranks of MI6 so quickly? He's been through this so many times, and yet they still suspect he's a double agent. He feels a bead of sweat on his upper lip as his frustration rises. You promised me I could see Guy Burgess today. The officers mutter something and shift uncomfortably. Then one of them says, I am sorry to tell you, he is dead. Philby leans back, winded. How? What happened? The officer tells him that Burgess drank himself to an early grave. Philby spends the rest of the interrogation in a daze. Eventually, they bundle him back in the car and drive him to his apartment. He stares out of the window, watches queues of people wait patiently to buy bread while party officials in sleek black cars stop outside restaurants. He can't bear to admit that Russia is as class-ridden as anywhere else, that the party control everything through fear and red tape. He walks up to his tiny flat with his minder and realises he's a prisoner here, a misfit, an upper-class Englishman no one believes or trusts. He's isolated and utterly alone. He's spent his whole life deceiving everyone around him. But as he takes in his surroundings, he wonders for the first time whether he was simply deceiving himself. 25 years later, June 1988, Home Counties, England. Elliot walks slowly through the field with his divining rods. He's looking for precious gems buried beneath the earth. It's been his hobby since he retired from the service 20 years ago, and it needs his full concentration. But today, his mind is elsewhere. This morning, he received a package from a contact in Moscow, a VHS tape of Kim Philby's funeral. He'd ordered Beetlejuice. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck is this? He's had no contact with Philby since he saw him all those years ago in Beirut. He's slowly come to terms with his betrayal, even though it cost him his career. He shudders when he thinks about the hundreds of agents compromised by Philby over the years and the countless numbers who died as a result. Now, though, it feels like the end of an era. His kind of intelligence work has long gone. He and Philby relied on building personal networks, on gathering gossip, long, liquid lunches and lots of belly laughs. Now, MI6 is formal and controlled, 
without any of the glamour of his day. But in his opinion, it's all the better for it. The Cambridge spy ring has made MI6 a much more professional organisation. Two hours later, he walks into his London flat, puts the tape in the machine, fixes himself a drink as he watches the jumpy footage of Philby's funeral. Philby's coffin, covered in red ribboned fabric, is followed by an endless line of weeping people. Philby's Russian wife prostrates herself over his body. A KGB official carries a photograph. Elliot pauses to get a better look. His friend is much older with thick grey hair, almost statesmanlike. Despite everything, he feels a tug of emotion as he watches his coffin being lowered into the ground. He sits in silence for a few minutes, then raises his glass to the screen and downs his drink. An hour later, he makes his way to 10 Downing Street. He's been giving Margaret Thatcher regular, informal briefings on the shifting situation in the Soviet Union. Today, they'll discuss Gorbachev's ongoing political reforms of Glasnost and Perestroika. He'll report how the Kremlin is trying to push through political freedoms while the whole economy is rapidly failing, and how the whole thing is on the verge of collapse. He puts up his ebony-handled umbrella, an old gift from Kim Philby, and shelters underneath it. Kim Philby was lauded by the Soviet Union, even after the collapse of the Berlin Wall. He died in a Moscow hospital in 1988. In 1990, the Russians issued a commemorative Kim Philby stamp. Guy Burgess hated the Soviet Union and described it as being like Glasgow on a Friday night. He died of alcohol-related illness in 1963. He and Philby never met again. Philby and Donald McLean fell out after Philby had an affair with McLean's wife, Melinda, in 1964. McLean died in 1984. Nicholas Elliott's career never recovered from his association with Philby. He died in 1994. The story of the Cambridge spies didn't end with Kim Philby. In 1979, Margaret Thatcher revealed to the House of Commons that there was a fourth spy at the heart of the British establishment. Anthony Blunt was a close friend of the Queen Mother and head of the royal family's art collection. At the same time, he was working for the KGB recruiting spies for the war against capitalism. In 2015, 400 files pertaining to the Cambridge spies were finally released by the National Archives, revealing new crucial details about the story. However, more than 20% of the files relating to the spies, most of whom defected more than 50 years ago, remain closed. It's unclear whether the world will ever know the full truth about one of the most embarrassing episodes in the history of the British establishment. Hello, Prime members. You can listen to British Scandal ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com slash survey. This is the third episode in our series, The Cambridge Spies. A quick note about our dialogue. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said, but all our dramatisations are based on historical research. If you'd like to know more about this story, you can read My Silent War by Kim Philby, Guy Burgess, The Spy Who Knew Everyone by Stuart Purvis and Jeff Hulbert, Stalin's Englishman, The Lives of Guy Burgess by Andrew Lowney, Enemies Within by Richard Davenport Hines, and A Spy Among Friends by Ben McIntyre. I'm Matt Ford. And I'm Alice Levine. Karen Laws wrote this episode. Additional writing by Alice Levine and Matt Ford. Script editing by James Magniak. British Scandal is produced by Samizdat Audio. Our associate producer is Francesca Gelardi Quadrio Corsio. Our producer is Millie Chu. The senior producer is Joe Sykes. Our executive producers are Theodora Leloudis, Stephanie Jens, and Marshall Louie for wondering.